Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today, and welcome to this webinar. This is the Nautical Institute uh, Automation Technical Advisory Group, and we are meeting today to have a conversation with you, seafarers around the world, about the technological challenges that are coming into the navigation space. David, perhaps I could ask you to um, uh, make a comment from the Institute's perspective. Thank you, John. Um, yes, it's not just the, uh, uh, my name is David Petraco. I'm the Director of Projects for the Nautical Institute Headquarters staff in London. Um, we put together this group because uh, increasingly over the years, our members have been asking us to update them on what's happening with technology, uh, not just uh, the challenges, but the opportunities and how they can prepare themselves, because ultimately the Nautical Institute is a professional body for continuous professional development. And a lot of that is individuals really wanting to know what are the opportunities with technology. Uh, and there, there, there are some myths out there, which I, I hope that my fellow panel will help bust. Um, and there's some really fantastic opportunities coming up. So that's why we have formed this group. Uh, the output from this group will be varied. Uh, today, it is a recording that will be used in a webinar. There have been articles in the Navigator magazine, in Seaways. We may do events, conferences, but it's how do we get that message out. So that's me. John, do you want to introduce yourself? I will introduce myself. Um, my name is John Owen. Uh, I'm a former seafarer, but I also had a life in P&I and hull and machinery insurance for plus 30 years. So I have a slightly jaundiced view on uh, the maritime world because it involved so, so many casualties. Um, but that makes technology all the more important in, in what we do going forward. Jill. Thank you. My name is Gillian Carson Jackson, and I also, I'm a former seafarer. I spent 22 years in the Canadian Coast Guard. I started off my career on ships back in the 1980s where we had not anywhere near the type of technology we do now. But I have to say now in the work that I've been doing, the work that I do with IALA, with the e-navigation committee, and looking at the developments in digital technologies, it's led me to recognize there are many opportunities as well as challenges to the developments of technology. And I look forward to this discussion. Arrow, over to you. Thank you, Gillian. So, Eero Lehtovara, working for ABB Marine and Ports, also an ex-seafarer, and uh, looking very much at, at the future bridges and, and, and what digitalization brings to the maritime industry, especially from the manufacturing uh, industry's point of view. And uh, <coughs> also trying to, to as, as John was saying, demystify a little bit what's going on. Uh, I have said in several different occasions, I will repeat myself now, also that, that I'm fully convinced that, that we will have completely unmanned ships, unmanned merchant ships within the next 200 years, uh, which basically translates to, to that, that, that in my belief, the majority of ships will not be unmanned tomorrow, which is one of the purposes of this discussion. So over to you. Um. So, my name is Jacqueline Burton. I'm right now heading creative design at Consberg Maritime, and that means that I'm in a way shaping the future of what ECTIS is, what integrated bridge systems are, what automation systems are, and what remote shore control operations can be uh, in the future. I'm an ex seafarer. I was at sea for 13 years, uh, mainly LNG regasification vessels, but also other vessel types. And yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Uh, so my name is Rahul Damodran. I um, set up a platform called Marine Startups uh, purely to incubate new ideas in the marine space, in the technology space, to cry, kind of bridge the gap between what I call techno optimism and techno pessimism, which is, a, which is a, a cause for serious concern between what we call generational views of technology. Uh, so that's the vision, and uh, that's that's what I, I want to do. And uh, you can't do it singularly. You can't do it with just with your company. So you use a platform like the Nautical Institute, uh, a powerful organization that can change and mend the ways people think about technology and bring about change. So yeah, 
Over to you, Anne. Hi, everybody watching this. I'm Anne Till. I'm, I'm also a former seafarer. And if you'd have asked me 22 years ago when I first went to sea, before we had ECDIS, before we had AIS, whether I would be now as chief vessel operator for Ocean Infinity, where we are building 25 vessels currently that we plan to operate remotely from remote control centers across the globe. I would, well, I wouldn't have understood the terminology, let alone believe you. So I'm really pleased to contribute in this discussion today. Thank you very much and welcome to our panel and welcome to you, the viewers to this webinar. Looking ahead or indeed looking back, we've had autopilots on ships for many, many years. That was the start of automation in uh, the navigation space. We are all, many of us, familiar with um, UMS engine rooms. So all that we are achieving now through the advances of technology and um, greater automation being in introduced in the tools that we have available is providing us with more opportunities to introduce levels of automation that will assist you as mariners in the performance of your duties. I think the one underlying message is, as Ira has already touched upon, that this is not going to take away your job, at least in the foreseeable future. Your job may evolve, but it's not going to take away, a, uh, take away your job. Also, automation is here. It's coming. It's probably coming at us like a train. And we need to be able to adapt, learn, and work with you in this space. So this panel this afternoon, today, this morning, wherever you happen to be, is going to discuss some of the challenges that um, are, are evident and how we believe automation should become the assistant, the virtual crew member that you have on the bridge that will make your job ideally easier, will help you remain situationally aware, more situationally aware, and reduce the number of incidents and accidents and near misses that might arise in the performance of your duties. So, looking ahead, um, and if I might ask Anne, uh, who is working at the extreme of where automation is today, where do you think you are finding the immediate challenges uh, in your particular sector? And opportunities. Both great questions, actually. How long have I got? Um, thanks, John. Challenges first. I would say that, and this is probably common of quite a lot of us operators here in the space, because just to clarify, we already operate some smaller USVs, which are unmanned small vessels are seven metres in length and they're remotely controlled from, from guard vessels. And already in that space we see the challenges that the regulatory framework provides. And as we are now expanding into SOLAS-sized vessels, we see that regulatory framework challenge increasing. We do not have any IMO codes covering vessels on the autonomous spectrum. so. We are relying on performance standards and various codes and regulations that are designed for traditional ships with people on board, which is then quite difficult to try and unpick and translate into now a shore setup where we have slightly different technological needs. And in that vein, of course, there are, of course, challenges with technology. This is emerging technology. This, as you say, you rightfully said, this is building on technology we have had in the industry for decades. We have had automation in autopilots, track pilots, GMDSS. There is a whole history of automation that we have all seen throughout our careers in the industry. And this is a continuation of it. However, this is quite a technological leap in some respects. It's been arguably going on in the unmanned small vessel sector for around two decades or more, but now this is a real leap to be trying to do this at scale with large ships. So there are technological challenges, and I will not pretend they're not to be, uh, especially as well with connectivity, which a lot of 
a lot of this relies on, especially when we're talking about remote operation of, of vessels. However, I think many are aware that there are communications advances happening as well with, with different communication networks. So it's, it's, that probably is my final point on, on challenges, I promise, is the fact that there's so many different aspects to make this happen. It's a lot of systems integration. It's a lot of ecosystems coming together rather than just an autonomous ship or a remotely controlled ship. But with that, as you rightfully said, David, comes opportunities. We see, I see opportunities for upskilling. I know myself as a seafarer, and I will be operating these vessels remotely as well. The, the need to upskill, but also the opportunities to upskill. I'm relatively new to the sector. I've been here at Ocean Infinity for 18 months. But already, I've learned a whole new language. I have a whole new vocabulary at my disposal. I understand a lot more about control engineering, systems engineering, connectivity. I just didn't know the breadth of a lot of how equipment that I've been using on board for years, how it actually worked. Um, and I can say I probably should have read the manual more, but at the same time, a lot of the principles behind it were not covered in what I learned at Maritime College probably was not covered in the manual. So there's real opportunities, even now, for the mariners of today to prepare for the future. And thank you very much. The Nautical Institute has just uh, concluded celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary here in Plymouth. And one of the takeaways from that event was that there is a recognition that techno technology technology in, 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 in the navigation space and automation in ships is moving at a pace much faster than the underlying legislation behind it. So Jackie, a question for you that um, relates to the mind and, and the, the well-being of, of those on board. Um, you have said to me in the past that the crew need to be curious and ask questions as to what and why the equipment is performing in a particular way. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, I think it's really important for the seafarers to be curious about how the systems that are installed on board actually work. As Anne said, that unless you are really curious and you start to dig in, you don't understand necessarily what the programmed logic is in the systems that you're using why if you use these different tuning methods on like autopilot or when you change different settings, it changes how the vessel is going to react depending on which system you're using. And being able to understand and predict, if I change this, it will change that. And when you're looking at things that are called autonomous systems or things that are called machine learning or things that are called AI, what you're really looking at is an advanced logic system. It has inputs and it has outputs. And those inputs affect what is put out based on what logical rules are constructed in the system. And whether those logical rules are in informed by machine learning, so a big data set where the computer is making inference from that data set and that data set only so it doesn't have other information that it's basing it on, or it's based on a pure logic that was programmed by a person who can make errors and mistakes. And I think one thing that was brought up during the conference today was that it will reduce human error if you're using autonomous and advanced systems. And that's not necessarily the case. You're shifting the possibility of error to a different time and a different place. Because the possibility of error can be in the settings that the operator makes, whether they understand what those setting changes will affect the system, or whether it's happening in the programming phase, or whether it's happening because you have uh, some kind of remote operation, where it will have an effect on the system and it won't necessarily reduce the human error, but it may replicate the same human error many times if it's not fixed. Um, so there's definitely some challenges, but there's also opportunities because if you learn what that error is, it's then replicatable for the next 100,000 
500,000 times that that logic is processed. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of opportunities and disadvantages, but you really have to be curious about why the systems are the way they are and what's happening with them. And I would invite you as a seafarer to become engaged with the different manufacturers who are making these systems for you, because unless they know your experience, they won't be able to make a great system for you because they don't understand and don't necessarily empathize with your position now. Because some of them, like myself, I haven't been to sea for four years, and some people, it's been much longer. And they're now instructing and advising and building these systems, and they don't understand your experience today. And I think it's very important that you share that as a member of the Institute. Jackie, thank you very much. So be curious and ask how and why. One of the challenging areas is the human interface, whether it's a touch medium, whether it's analog, and whether we use haptics, physical interfaces, so that you get some sort of instrument feedback. Eero, can you um, provide us with some commentary from your perspective as, as to what the better user interface is and where the challenges and opportunities exist in that arena. Thank you for throwing me under the bus. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that, that it's, it's, uh, there's a number of questions in there. I think that, that one of the things that, that we've been discussing is how will the digital crew member fit in with the rest of the crew, which will be one of the big questions going forward. Uh, I think that, that uh, another kind of topic in that area is that, that when we increase the automation and the technologies on board, and, and referring to what was said earlier and, and what, what Jackie was saying, is that I would also emphasize that, that, uh, that the situation hasn't changed that much. What Jackie said should have been clear for everyone already for a long time with all the technologies that, that we have had. And going forward with these technologies, I think that we still need to have crews on board who know what the uh, technology is supposed to do and why, how it fits into the big picture. And, and, and you asked about the user interface. I'm not quite sure if that's the right topic to discuss because uh, we still need to understand what is the function that, that, that the ship is supposed to be doing. And there are several ways uh, there uh, to, 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 to keep track of what's going on, but that, that to, for the navigator or the responsible person, whether it's in the engine room or on the bridge, need to understand what's going on. I think that's still going to be one of the key topics. Uh, the handover of information, both from machine to people and from people to machine, so that, that we're doing the right things, are going to be completely essential. Uh, I can't answer you to a question on a specific user interface, except that I hate touch screens, which we have discussed earlier, uh, because going into that area, I think that, that if you're maneuvering a ship, you need to use your eyes to look what's going on and not to, to find out what's going on on a screen. Uh, so, so, so that's kind of my personal comment in this case. But I really think, as I said, the understanding of what's going on is going to be essential all the way. Thank you. Okay. John, um, if you don't mind me just picking up on something that Eero said. Um, we, we've been talking so far about the technology, um, but one of the questions that we're asked at the Nautical Institute most often is, okay, what's driving this? Is this manufacturers doing it because they can? Um, or is this actually why is it doing something good? And we did a survey of Nautical Institute members um, a couple years ago, and I was really pleased that the response was almost 100% positive. And then when we asked, what can technology do to make your life better? The two top answers were, one, um, it can relieve the burden. It can take up some, you know, get rid of the log books, you know, things that we don't, that are distracting on board, let technology do that for us uh, so that we can focus on what's important for us as mariners. The other thing was target detection. 
you know, I'm on a ship, you know, you know, many meters up. I've got uh, deck cargo. Uh, I I can't detect small targets. Uh, so if you can show me what targets out there that I need to worry about, that would be fantastic. So. Those are some of the whys. Uh, maybe we could have a, a, a little chat about other, are there other whys or how technology that's developing now can meet those um, requirements of seafarers. I'd like to say something on that. So what we see when people come to us for autonomous vessels, it's not the seafarers that are doing it, and it's not the traditional ship owners that are instigating the development of autonomous ships. It is supply chain management. It is the cargo owners themselves wanting to manage their full logistics chain from their point of manufacturing to their point of deliverance. We see them wanting to integrate it with their own port facilities. We see them want to integrate it with their own trucking facilities. And as our organization does, we supply the technology to allow them to do that. And they've been good partners in developing that technology. But they're not the traditional ship owners, and they don't understand necessarily all of the ways seafaring works, especially at deep sea. And they're not interested in the deep sea market. They're interested in getting their cargo from point A to point B as effectively as they can. Just to add on that, I, I think that that was David was saying. Sorry, Jillian, uh, is that that there always needs to be an economic driver. There's a driver behind. It's not that that we want to produce these things. Yeah. Yes, we do want, and we want to sell them, and we want to make profit. Yeah. But somebody who needs to want to have them. Otherwise, yes. we don't have it. And that's always the case. That that it has to make sense for somebody. And there's a lot of different drivers in that. And so far in the discussions that I've had, none of the drivers is to get rid of the sailor. It's to improve the logistics yeah, chain, exactly. it's improving yeah. safety, uh, and, and, and that's also the philosophy that, that we're working with, is to provide technologies that, that make, make the, the, the operation with the current crews more efficient, more safe, and bring some added value to the, to the, to the supply chain. Mm -hmm. and, and that needs always to be there. Sorry, Gillian. You go ahead now. I, I wanted to come and bring that maybe a little bit to the shore experience as well, because, of course, in vessel traffic services, we've had decision support tools for decades. They've been using technology and machine learning algorithms to identify and to provide options and solutions. We've had this within the, on the ship side as well. This idea of your digital uh, crew member, the, the, your digital crewmate that you have, it's actually doesn't necessarily need to be on board the vessel as well because you've got the digital links now with the ship and the shore. Yes, there are those challenges with connectivity that, that Anne highlighted. We are seeing changes and developments within the technologies. Communications technologies are moving forward. But this aspect of blurring those lines between ship and shore and making best use of technology to support that cargo chain, to support the supply chain, and to integrate the various players within the port. This is work that has been going on for a number of years now, and we do have some technologies that are gone beyond the innovation stage. They're moving now into the application stage, and that's what we're starting to see. It's not about replacing people, it's about the human and machine working together and having that opportunity. You need to know, you need to be curious, you need to understand what is normal behavior though, so that you can understand when it's not normal. And that's where the concept of, for example, digital intelligence, that, that we need to learn, all of us need to learn how to make things work, what should be happening. You pick up your iPhone, you don't take a training course on your iPhone, you don't pick a training course on your smartphone. You understand what it should be there to be able to do. It probably does a lot more than you use it for, but you understand what it should be able to do. When it's not working, you also understand how to do initial troubleshooting. So from that point of view, when you're doing your human-machine interface, I guess goes back a bit to that interface, that GUI that you have, how are we going to interact with that? It comes down to an intuitive approach 
and understanding as the seafarer, as the shore personnel, what it should be able to do and recognising when it doesn't do it. If I could just throw in yeah. one more use case there as well. Uh, for us as a company in Ocean Infinity, a few years ago we were involved in the, the search for the missing airliner MH370. And we had a conventional vessel with subsea vehicles and sounding technology to try to find the plane. Now we are going back to find the plane, by the way, because it's, it's unfinished business. However, the, air, the search area, as, as many people know, is, is quite a long way from shore, a long way from support services. And the vessels that, we, that were searching that area, conventional vessels, quite thirsty in terms of fossil fuel use, having to go into and out of port for crew change, which is a, the most legitimate reason to go into port, because we all go to sea to have our time at home with our families. However, that was a significant time period of each mission to go out to search the different search patterns for MH370. And at that point, the organization took a step back and thought, well, one day we can do this with vessels that do not have a crew on board, where we do not have to go in for crew change. With the use of hybrid technologies, it means the vessel's endurance, without needing to come in for crew change, can be months, potentially, and uh, this was a long-term vision. This, isn't, this wasn't the company thinking we can go back tomorrow and suddenly go do this. But the benefits of using technology, whether that be remotely controlling a vessel, whether that be hybrid technology, all came together for the company for this, this one use case and then other use cases just snowballed from that. And I think the important point there as well is that it's not replacing the mariner because this use case revolves around mariners sat doing the job in a shore control center. So there are still bridge officer of the watch, there's engine officer of the watch, there's a captain, there's also the wealth of offshore personnel, many of which I know are members of the Nautical Institute. So we will still have client reps watching the job from ashore. We will still have ROV pilots remotely working from a shore control center. So the whole professional organization that is normally found on a vessel will still be actively day-to-day -day working on watch but from ashore using technology to enable that ship one day to be on an isolated search pattern for maybe months at a time and crucially greener and helping the decarbonization agenda as well. And you know, if, if I can add something there, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, seafarers have, have to got to understand that uh, it's all a building block. It's all a step towards that kind of vision, that kind of future. Uh, I'll try and draw analogies to the to the finance sector. Back when Web 1.0, that was what we know knew as the Y2K, the World Wide Web. Uh, financial traders actually didn't come to the floor in the NYSE because they said they want to be part of a digital terminal. But you know what happened to the finance sector after that? It f skyrocketed in the next 10 years. And then came 2008, which was bad. But still, we know that with technology. You have a negative, you have a positive. With Web 2.0, you mentioned iPhones, uh, Jillian. Apps was Web 2.0. It changed the way we did everything, what we do today as well. And Web 3.0 is going to touch every industry that traditionally hasn't had technology. It's already doing it with agriculture, dairy. I think it's, it's time that the maritime sector kind of embraced it, realized that we won, we, we're all part of a block to get to that vision. We're not losing our jobs. We're not losing... We, we're enhancing the way we're going to do our jobs in the future. And that's what I think it's, it's, it's basically all about. Uh, and that's what the seafarers got to understand about it. One, if I may, still, sorry, to, <laughs> to, 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 to answer the actual question that, that David had. Uh, I think that, that uh, situational awareness is, is, is a term that, that I guess everyone had heard. It has to do with things happening outside the ship. But uh, in, in, I think it's, it's equally important to understand that it's happening inside the ship. We need to know that the ship as a system is functional. But uh, we see a lot of, of technologies coming to, to, to have a better understanding of what's happening in the immediate vicinity of the vessel. Uh, we know that, that there's a proposition coming up uh, to, to IMO for the electronic lookout function mm -hmm. to see how we can use technologies, cameras, combined with all the other uh, sensors that, that we have on board to, to improve what's going on 
couple of meters in front of the bow, but that, that also as far forward as, as we can see. And I think that, that uh, we've had this discussion during these last days also when ships are getting bigger. If you're standing on a 400 meter ship, the human eye just can't get it what's going around the ship. You, you, I mean, the, the, the vision has its limitations uh, and, and the human brain at least mine has a lot of limitations, and, and then we need to, to use technologies where they fit and can support us. Uh, and that's coming. I think that, that that's definitely, I think that there's a lot of companies that, that already are working on and providing these technologies, and they will be more available, and then prices will come down when, when more and more are going to, to buy it. So I think that, that it's going to be a combination of the human assessing what the technology is seeing with great accuracy and prioritizing the targets. And I think it's actually really interesting to add on is that humans have things that they're super good at, like creative problem solving. And they have things that they're notoriously bad at, which is monitoring over a long period of time. And if we can use the digital crew members to do the things that we're not good at and to tell us when there is something that we're good at and it needs assistance, then we can make a much better working experience for the seafarers on board. And the digital lookout kind of functions and uh, not navigational assistance can really help with that because it can be monitoring in the same way that the UMS system is monitoring alarms to say, there's a problem with this system. Now I need a human intervention to do what people are good at, which is finding out a creative way to solve this problem. Um, and I think when you're talking about really complex sea areas, which was another topic when they brought up uh, the Singapore Straits, when you have people on paddle boards and kayaks <laughs> crossing the middle of the channel, um, then it's a human problem. But you also need someone to tell you when you're on a vessel that big that there's a small thing there and you don't necessarily see it and you can't necessarily monitor for it. John, can I just come back to Arrow on a point? Sorry. No, 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 no. no. John is the moderator, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, very interesting, uh, uh, and, and Jackie. One of the debates that we've had is everybody wants better situational awareness, but there's a fear that the more data that comes in, the more information from different sensors that comes in, how do you balance that increase of information with increased situational awareness rather than distraction? Um. Power There's very back. few alarms in, in VTS, and it really has been identified, and they can tailor them, and it just, it's, the machine's working in the background, and it tells you, okay, well, under keel clearance will be breached. This vessel's not making a turn. This vessel's departing from the channels. That make sense. There's so yeah. much that's going on in that area, and that we don't want to overload, I mean, uh, the, 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 the alarms on the bridge of a ship, how many times, how many times have you turned down the lights on the, on the, um, uh, watertight door alarms because they're just bothering yeah. you at night time. All the 58. Oh, oh yeah, alarms. all of them. Yeah. All of the different alarms go. What you need to do is you need to make good sense of the data. There's a lot of information coming in. Seafarers need to understand that the data is there to support them. It's not there to go against them. Yeah, but them. not if it comes yeah. raw and, no, and, and exactly. assaults you. It needs to be prioritized. Yes. It does need to make sense. But yeah. even then, in yeah. order to put those filters into use, yes, they need to have contextual information about what operation is going on, mm. about what sea area they're in. If they're under pilotage, then you can have these set of alarms and these sets of settings. So the automation yeah. needs to have yeah. situational awareness. But remember, we don't want to go can't. too deep. No, no, but it should. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's going too deep. But because opinion. the problem is that we're talking to seafarers who barely know autonomous ships are even coming in the next 10 years. And We're not talking about autonomous ships. Oh, no, no, about okay. about well, no, decision support yeah. tools decision on support. vessels yeah. to support your... Uh, when you're using the tools in anger, when you're actually out there navigating, what can the tools do to support you? You need to have that contextualization. We could have geofencing, for example, where you've got decision support tools. You come into 
12 nautical miles off the coastline, a certain set of rules come in place. Mm -hmm. You come up within, uh, within two nautical miles of the pilot boarding ground, another set of rules come in place. The pilot's on board, another set of rules come in place. The seafarer doesn't have to do anything about that. It's been built it's into the, the same contextualization. Like changing all of your depth contour settings for going near land, because then you're near coastal, but you have a different yeah. set of settings than you would have. Yes. But you have to manually change all of those settings right now because there to. isn't. Well, it's not smart enough to. Yeah, okay. Well, but, but still, in some you ways, need you need to, to because they're not connected. Yes. But in order to understand that, there has to be a better collaboration between the manufacturers, the seafarers, the ship owners, and the shipyards. And I had a really long discussion about alarm filtering over the course of many months with uh, the SIGTO Human Elements Committee when we were writing the alarm book. Uh, for gas tankers and we were writing uh, human factors and control systems basically and the problem is that as an OEM, as a manufacturer, we don't know in what context that alarm has significance for the seafarer and in which situation. We only know that because of the parameters that are set that is an alarm scenario. And that alarm scenario is either a caution or warning or an emergency. And then we give you, it's an alarm. Please do something. And I, I, I think this is, for years, mariners have been complaining about too many alarms and them being distracting. But the, the thing is, from an engineering point of view, when an engineer builds these systems, he goes, oh, that could be useful if they knew it. That could be useful if they knew it. No, they don't it. think that like that. They think, they I want it. to have my alarm in my feature, and, and all of the engineers in all of the manufacturing companies are, are, are competing about who gets most of the alarms. Yeah. And then that's where... <laughs> but no, I don't even think that that's necessarily the problem. I think it's that those elements are given alarm parameters from what's expected from the shipyards, what's expected from the regulators. And so they say, oh, well, that's a pressure alarm. It's going to have an alarm. And then you go, OK, well, we have logic to not alarm when things are not running, which is already helpful. Because <laughs> if you got all the alarms for all the equipment that wasn't running, it would make you completely crazy. But we don't, as an industry, regularly tune the alarms on that vessel for that vessel's operations. Mm -hmm. It's a very general case of what alarms are received and how it's set up. Um, and that's something that needs collaboration to fix because and the manufacturer's not going to fix it, the shipyard's not going to fix it, the seafarer can't fix it, and the ship owner can instigate it being fixed. Mm -hmm. But unless they really go for it, you're going to have alarm cascades no matter what. And on top of that, there's going to be 15, 20 different manufacturers with their own set of systems of and yeah. philosophies yeah. on the bridge too. Of course. And the interface and the experience with yeah. each manufacturer being different. I think but with navigation, it's easy to do that because you can merge situational awareness with AR in that sense. You can, you can project it onto the wheelhouse, onto the, uh, the bridge windows, and you can actually project it saying that that vessel in that direction you, you're monitoring it, but there's an alarm coming up in AR there. Yeah, but there's also problems with for, projecting for sure. things on glass. Yeah, for, for sure. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. sure. you can get a lot of glare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but, but it's, it's, you, it's possible in navigation to kind of use situation awareness to then zero out your alarms in that particular but direction. It, but in some ways, BAM tried to help <laughs> with this, yeah. but that problem isn't being solved on the right level to actually have a good I effect. Agree. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Because it's just dealing with the representation of the alarms in right. some ways and yeah. making the silence all one silence, which is already, thank you. But uh, besides that, it's, it's not fixing the operational issues that need to be fixed in the systems to it work well. It goes back to your, your initial concept of the fact is that you have input uh, data in and you have things that happen on the output. Mm -hmm. And right now we have things that come in and we've got this general concept of alarms, but we don't have the context of when is that alarm going to be going. And, well, and, and you where can does that find fit? out. If you go into your systems, you can see that what the logic is. But there are thousands and thousands yeah. of alarm points, yeah. and each one of them can have a different logic. 
and each one of them can have a different uh, bottom alarm and top alarm. Top and different alarm. systems and are different easier outputs. to go into yeah. exactly. than others yeah. to understand. Yeah. And, and every and manufacturer where, deals with it differently. Isn't that where this digital crew member could come in and, and help support with that? Because yes. not every seafarer is going to have a chance to go in and learn about all these different points for their alarms. And that, I think, is where digitalization, where this digital but I think crew member can be there to help. But I think that's where doing good human factors design is mm. so important. Mm. Yeah. And you know that's one thing about my current role that's a high focus. We have to make sure that we build some transparency into the system so that the seafarers can be able to inform themselves about what the systems are doing, especially when we're going into remote operation scenarios. Why is this alarming? What ship is it even coming from? Mm -hmm. okay. how, how can I handle this as an operator? Um, what alarm was actually the root cause alarm because that can be hard to tell depending on the timings of the alarms because some alarms have a time delay built into it so you won't get the alarm until five seconds after it came into alarm and so then it's at a different place in the alarm list and dealing with those kind of human factors problems is a real challenge for the industry to make automation truly useful and to improve on you know the different aspects of having accidents and near misses and other things so J jacqueline just for the people listening one what can they do and what can the nautical institute do but i think for the people listening digging into the systems that you have and how they're constructed and opening a dialogue with both your management ashore and with the manufacturers of your equipment because they can help you tune it properly, but they can't do it without you. And then I think for the Institute, it's really to make sure that these kind of collaborations are happening while the technology is evolving because the manufacturer can't know necessarily the experience of the seafarers as much as the Institute can. And it's, I think the future is built on collaboration. And we can only build the future together, and we have to make sure that it's a future we want. Don't you think that? Just to add in there, there's, there's, you know, when, when I was at sea as a kid at 2002, 2003, we actually had Inmarsat's volume on board where you could actually apply for a beta testing hardware program mm -hmm. where Inmarsat would actually send you an, an equipment on board to actually test it out. So I was part of the beta test. I don't know if, if um, equipment manufacturers are able to do it today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can actually provide it on a tablet and let them use the user interface and experience. But I don't know if it's, if it's done in that form as a feedback loop for the seafarer, maybe a beta testing hardware program where seafarers are able to engage. And, and that kind of information is available nowadays with the, with the internet. It was back there. Then it was there on the Inmarsat manuals. So I think that is something, you know, in terms of a feedback loop between manufacturer and seafarer. So, so, so but, just for the listeners. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, question to Jackie, and then also back to you, that, that isn't then standardization something that, that should be included in the discussion? Because now there's not two components or two bridges that, that are alike, and, and, and there's not one alarm philosophy or philosophy of any kind of activities or on any functionalities on any equipment. I think that standardization is really a double-edged sword. You have the advantages that it's always the same, but you also have the disadvantage that it won't evolve. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the problems with the way Actis was regulated in the beginning. Because for the longest time, everyone had the 27-inch screen, even though there were way bigger screens available later on, because when they wrote the the standard, it was written to say, oh, well, that's a big screen. That should be enough. Yeah, but well, I think descriptive could, standards yes, are goal-based. Yes, you can do standards that are goal-based, yes, yeah. outcomes-based standards. So you can actually look at what it is that you want it to do, not prescribe the size of a screen or prescribe where... But I think uh, that that's so where it, it yeah. gets a little bit dangerous because it's very hard to write good standards that aren't descriptive. So David, we have a number of more uh, yeah. panels coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, 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 uh, uh, ja Jacqueline, I, absolutely standardization is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. But I just want to say to the, the listeners out there 
that um, the Nautical Institute has been looking at these issues for well over 10 years, and we do have a relationship with an organization called CIRM, which is the um, uh, Association of Electronics Providers. Um, and we have a relationship where if you want to get involved in beta testing, if you're a mariner and you want to get involved with beta testing, we can put your details into a database so that if any manufacturers want to have access to mariners, they can through that system. So if anybody wants to send their details in, please do, and we'll set you up on that system. It's not a perfect system. Um, but, uh, you know, we're working to build that, those relationships. Thank you very much. That's been a very interesting uh, discussion on a wide range of topics, and it's evident uh, that some of the remedies are, are not so straightforward. So there are challenges about which you have to be curious, you have to ask questions of yourself, how and why. So David has previously mentioned the, the opportunity and what, or well, the opportunities, and let's, let's hope there are, are, are plenty, of what uh, enhancements and what improvements there can be in relation to the support that this digital crew member is, is going to provide to you and ultimately uh, what things you can do less of, and immediately it comes to mind that um, less paper, if you've got a digital interface on every other aspect of what's happening in the bridge, why keep on filling in bits of paper? So if I could go along the, uh, the panel here, and uh, I'll start with Gillian, and, and ask what opportunities she believes will come from the advances in technology that we're talking about today. Gillian. Thank you. I think that there are so many opportunities. I'm going to focus just on this concept of providing opportunities to engage with the maritime environment, perhaps at a level that you may not have thought of initially. Supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion within the concept of having, for example, a remote control center somewhere ashore. You could have an open concept of engaging with more seafarers, with more professionals in the maritime industry that may not have had the opportunity to go to sea. So uh, perhaps you've got um, some physical disabilities or neurodiversity that you could then bring in and start gathering the, the great ideas and concepts and visual benefits that you have from correction and visualizing the benefits that you can have within the industry through the more effective use of technology in support of the maritime activities. So I think I'll leave it at that one, because I think there's a lot of others. OK. Eero. I think that, that the ships and the maritime technologies are, are, are kind of catching up uh, to the level of, of what everything else is, is where we are on, every, on all the other sectors. Ships are maybe going to be cool workplaces that, 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 that are fit for, for, for most people, not ancient, uh, you know, old technologies, uh, which I think that, that, that will make it uh, more interesting for young people to, to get back to sea. I think that, that some years back I heard quite often the, the, the term that, that, you know, this is a dying industry. Uh, I don't believe that. I think it's quite the opposite. And I think that the tools that, that will be available will feel much more familiar for the for the the the, the uh, generations that, that have grown up with touch screens and, 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 and games and, and whatnot uh, and then we are getting closer to the reality where we are today with technologies that we'll have on the bridge so I hope that that, that will make it more interesting to come to ships and not less check it well, I think there's a lot to be gained with efficiency. I think there's a lot to be gained uh, on the sustainability side. I think there's also a lot to be gained, as Jillian had said, with the diversity and equity and inclusion in maritime. I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities than there are now for people with seafaring backgrounds. I think that there'll be a lot 
more different kinds of roles than there are now. You see that now we have electrotechnical officer, which wasn't the thing a few years ago. Um, there's going to be a lot more technical roles within maritime. And I think there'll also be more hands-on roles. You're going to see like import maintenance is going to become a definite thing um, because as manning and schedules and efficiency is a topic, so will be maintenance in ports where you can operate the vessel effectively. And if you have using some of these future fuels or if you have a battery powered vessel, for example, it will take time to charge and you'll do all the maintenance in port. And maybe you won't be carrying all the spares on board. Maybe you will have the spares at uh, shore facilities. And it's going to change the way that we work, but it can change it for the better, but we have to make it change in that direction. I, th I think uh, going back to what I said about techno-optimism, to kind of qualify what that was, uh, I think it's super exciting to be in this space and an industry that, that has just about accepted technology and now we are running with it. We are, we are really running with it. And I think that, that is what is exciting and that's what if seafarers see that vision, you're able to get, get, you know, get that thing that you have a solution for everything. You have something in, sen in the sense there is a solution for everything, but that shouldn't be the, the motto. I mean, that you should look at it as a positive thing. There is a solution. Technology is going to give you challenges, but it's also going to give you solutions high-end solutions and that's what and and I, I like that you mentioned uh, you know neurodiversity because if you see a lot of the sectors the crypto sector the finance sector uses people with borderline autism because they're so good at what they do they're able to actually focus on something so well imagine if we have that kind of talent in this sector and and the possibilities of an individual and one individual that can change the way we actually operate autonomous ships i mean that'd be brilliant and that person can only do it from the, the, uh, from, a, from an office or from a home. You can never go on a vessel. But the kind of uh, opportunity that ca that one individual can generate is, is immense and limitless. Yeah, and, and building on that, we've seen, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also prior to that, the rise of, of mental health issues and the fact yeah. that it doesn't necessarily preclude somebody from working at sea. However, it's very difficult to get ongoing support if you are away for months at a time and you're on shifts. Whereas if you are working in a shore control centre, it's much easier to access that support, certainly for those type of conditions. I also have fellow seafarers who are type 1 diabetic, who have, have other medical physical restrictions, also physical restrictions. They are in a wheelchair, they are on crutches, and they are unable to get an unrestricted medical to go work on a worldwide basis on board. Whereas in future, remote control of vessels can give people those opportunities. Also people, seafarers, who love what they do in seafaring, but are also interested in programming, for example, and they can blend those two passions into future work. So I think that's very exciting. And the, the other, because it's very difficult when you're at this end of the table to come up with new options, <laughs> but the other one that always sticks in my head is in terms of a crisis situation, where on board you have a fixed number of crew able to deal with a problem, especially for command and control. Whereas in a control center, if you have a worsening situation that you need to deal with, you can quite effectively flood that situation with some resource planning because you are doing operations at scale with a number of people. Now, obviously, we do not want an entire room full of captains trying to make a decision. Too many cooks can spoil the broth and too many captains in one room certainly could. <laughs> but we do see already that damage control and expert damage stability services have existed for many years and shore control centers gives us so many more opportunities to be able to flood expertise into a room but also facilitate training and mentoring because we ne we can also have seafarers who are maybe in the twilight years of their career who do not want to go ashore go to sea for months at a time or sit in quarantine hotel rooms which hopefully will be a thing of a past soon uh, and but still want to pass on that knowledge to the future generation. Whereas they could come into their local shore control center a few times a week 
use their experience for the good of a shipping company, but at the same time be able to help newly qualified officers and pass that knowledge on without having to necessarily hang up their sea boots like they would otherwise. So I think there are wide societal benefits. There are also great environmental benefits. There are also challenges, as we've discussed, but I think it's navigating through these waters to make sure that as we progress, we make the most of these opportunities and we don't just see the difficulties. Okay, thank you very much for that discussion and please keep those questions and comments coming. So to, to summarise that discussion, um, we have seen that there are a great many um, opportunities that um, e exist that might not be re so readily apparent to you in your day-to-day -day work and, and that, that has been useful. Um, so decision support from ashore is clearly one area that um, there, there will be uh, some, some uh, scope for interaction. You, you see that interaction on a daily basis today. That is perhaps one area that's going to evolve. But David, if I might ask you now to um, summarize from the Institute's perspective uh, where you think um, uh, this, is, this is actually going. Sure. Thanks, John, and, and, and thanks everybody on, on the panel. The Nautical Institute is a professional body. Uh, our main role is to help our members uh, develop themselves uh, and to listen to the voices of our members and represent those in, in public. So all this really helps us. What I can say is that the Nautical Institute will continue to do its best to let everybody know what's happening in the technology development, let, let know what the challenges are, what the opportunities are, so that they can be part of the solution. Um, so please continue your membership, continue bringing your ideas, and it's only when we share ideas like this amongst professionals that we can find the best solution forward, and we will not stop that process.